In this presentation, we will take a look at some things Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 11 and Matthew chapter 12. First of all, let's take a look at Matthew chapter 11, the last three verses, verses 28 through 29, where Christ talks about those who are heavy laden and labor and taking his yoke upon us. The Doctrine and Covenants, section 82, verses 8 through 10, talks about what is Christ's yoke. It says, and again, I say unto you, I give unto you a commandment that you may understand my will concerning you. Or in other words, I give you directions. I like that description of what commandments are. Commandments are directions from our Father in heaven of how to return to him. Or in other words, I give unto you directions how you may act before me, that it may turn to you for your salvation. I, the Lord, am bound when ye do what I say, but when you do not what I say, ye have no promise. So from this we learn being yoked to Christ is doing what he says. That's how we take his yoke upon us. And he says if we will do that, then we will receive rest. Concerning that great promise and how Christ, doing what Christ wants us to do, and following in his ways, how that can give us rest and peace and can make life a little easier. Matthew 11 verse 30 says, My yoke is easy. President Russell M. Nelson gave the following story in General Conference. He said, during the recent open house of the Washington, D.C. Temple, a member of the House Committee witnessed an insightful interchange as he escorted several prominent journalists through the temple. Somehow, a young family became attached to this media tour. One reporter kept asking about the journey of a temple patron as he or she moves through the temple. He wanted to know if the temple journey is symbolic of the challenges in a person's journey through life. A young boy in the family picked up on the conversation. When the tour group entered an endowment room, the boy pointed to the altar where people kneeled to make covenants with God and said, Oh, that's nice. Here is a place for people to rest on their temple journey. I doubt that the boy knew just how profound his observation was. He likely had no idea about the direct connection between making a covenant with God in the temple and the Savior's stunning promise. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavily laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, and ye shall find rest unto your souls." For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Dear brothers and sisters, I grieve for those who leave the church because they feel membership requires too much of them. They have not yet discovered that making and keeping covenants actually makes life easier. Each person who makes covenants in baptismal fonts and in temples and keeps them has increased access to the power of the Savior, or to the power of Jesus Christ. Please ponder that stunning truth. The reward for keeping covenants with God is heavenly power, power that strengthens us to withstand our trials, temptations, and heartaches better. This power eases our way. Those who live the higher laws of Jesus Christ have access to his higher power. Thus, covenant keepers are entitled to a special kind of rest that comes to them through their covenant re covenantal relationship with God. So through making and keeping our covenants, we can receive more power of Christ to withstand the many afflictions we will face in mortality. And that, in turn, makes it easier and our burdens a little lighter to carry because we are yoked together with Jesus Christ. David 
Elder David A. Bednar of the Twelve said this about the scripture about being yoked with Christ, quoting, A yoke is a wooden beam normally used between a pair of oxen or other animals that enables them to pull together on a load. A yoke places animals side by side so they can move together in order to accomplish a task. Consider the Lord's uniquely individual invitation to take my yoke upon you. Making and keeping sacred covenants yokes us to and with the Lord Jesus Christ. In essence, the Savior is beckoning us to rely upon him and pull together with him, even though our best efforts are not equal to and cannot be compared with his. As we trust in and pull our load with him during the journey of mortality, truly his yoke is easy and his burden is light. We are not and never need be alone. We can press forward in our daily lives with heavenly help. Through the Savior's atonement, we can receive capacity and strength beyond our own. Again, brothers and sisters, if we want to get through mortality with a little more rest, with a little more strength, with a little more help, that extra strength will come through being yoked with Christ. And that yoke will come through our covenants. Let's now turn to chapter 12 of Matthew. In verses 1 through 9, the Savior has an exchange with the scribes and Pharisees about the, sur the, the Sabbath day. And what is proper, not proper to do on the Sabbath day? As the Pharisees feel like he is breaking the Sabbath and they are trying to convict him. And showing the people, look, don't follow him. He doesn't even keep the Sabbath day. The Pharisees thought they had evidence that the Savior's disciples had broken the law of Moses by plucking some grain, rubbing it between their hands to get rid of the chaff, and then eat it. And Matthew 12, 2 says, But, then, but when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, Thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. So according to their tradition, their laws, rubbing it in your hands and blowing the chaff away and eating it was work and it was winnowing. And according to their traditions that they had come up with and the added laws they had added, they didn't come from Christ. They considered this of breaking the Sabbath day. First, the Savior as Jehovah never gave such law or prohibition under the law of Moses. This was added to the law by uninspired men who claimed to be leaders in Israel. Second, the Savior's response to this is instructive. Now let's read from Matthew chapter 12, his response starting with verse 3. But he said unto them, have you not read what David did when he was hungered, and they that were with him? So this was David when he is being chased by Saul and trying to be killed. And he's fleeing from Saul in the Old Testament. Verse 4, how he entered into the house of God and did eat the shoe bread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests. And David wasn't under condemnation for that. Only the priests were to eat the shoe bread. But David, on the Lord's errand and doing the Lord's work, was permitted to eat the shoe bread because of their hunger and the sustenance that they needed that day. Closely tied to that example, being on the Lord's errand, doing the Lord's work. Doing the Lord's work is never breaking the Sabbath day as long as we're from our heart in the service of the Lord. Verse 5, Or have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath day the priest in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? In other words, the priest on the Sabbath day, is they offer all of those sacrifices, they have to do a lot of work. So according to their reasoning, they should be breaking the Sabbath, right? But no, because they're in the service of the Lord, they are blameless. But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. My disciples who went through these wheat fields and rubbed the wheat between their hands because they needed food 
They are serving one greater than the temple, me, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Therefore, they are guiltless. They are blameless. But if ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, ye would not have condemned the guiltless. The Savior here now is quoting an Old Testament scripture that they would have been very familiar with. It's from Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, which reads, For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. All of the law of sacrifice under the law of Moses and all of those different offerings, they weren't just for the sake of offering animals or the fruit of the ground of, and their food. It wasn't just for the sake of making those sacrifices in the temple. It was to teach them to come unto the knowledge of God, to teach them about the firstborn son of Jesus Christ and about his sacrifice. That's what he desired. I didn't just desire the killing of animals in and of itself. I wanted you to learn. I wanted you to learn mercy, forgiveness, justice, love, repentance, that Christ would teach by his very life. And so if they would have known what Hosea 6.6 6 meant, they would not have condemned his disciples. They would have realized that the Savior is Lord of the Sabbath. He can decide what is proper on the Sabbath day. And serving and following him will never be breaking the Sabbath. Verse 8, For the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath day. Again, he declares his divine sonship to the Father and that he is Lord. Let's go now to, in chapter 12 of Matthew, verses 22 through 30. They are seeking for any evidence they can to persuade the people not to follow Christ because the scribes and the Pharisees are losing their power. They're losing their popularity among the people, their leadership roles. They are that prideful and that caught up in power and lust for power and the fame that it brings. And so they're looking for any way to discredit the Savior. And so when he performs a miracle, they have to somehow do away with it. And they come up with the brilliant idea that he does miracles because he is Satan himself or he is a devil of Satan. The Pharisee's dilemma then is the miracle he just performed in this chapter 12, the healing of a man who was born blind and dumb, was a known reality. Blind eyes now saw, deaf ears now heard. The demon from hell had, been, had given up his stolen home. Jesus' act of mercy and healing was known to all. They were even hailing him as David's son. Unless this and like miracles are explained away, the priest crafts of the priests will be placed, be replaced by a new order. The scribes and the Pharisees must disabuse the public mind or lose their position of power and influence over the people. And so somehow they've got to explain away these miracles. Jesus clearly points out the flaw in the Pharisees' logic of him being Beelzebub, the prince of devils, that enabled him to do the miracles. A kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. Thus the Savior's demand. Either make the tree good and the fruit good, or make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by its fruit. That's verse 33. I cannot do miracles and good things. I cannot produce good things and be from Beelzebub. First of all, Satan would be divided against itself, and that kind of house can't stand. The second flaw in their logic is you cannot have an evil tree and produce good fruit. I cannot be evil and from Satan himself and produce good things. Satan cannot do good. So Pharisees and scribes, be consistent. If my, what I produce is good, then I am good. If I am evil, the things I produce will be evil. The Jill Smith translation of Matthew 12, 22-23 now says, 
And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast out devils? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. For they also cast out devils by the Spirit of God. For unto them is given power over devils, that they may cast them out. Meaning, the meaning of these verses then is this. Jesus cast out devils. He did it by the power of God. For Satan cannot cast out Satan. And therefore, he is divine, that is, Christ is. The kingdom has been set up, the true church has been established among them, and, mark it well, the others who cast out devils had the same power. They too were members of the church, they too held the holy priesthood, they were followers of the one who then spoke to them. That's what he meant by those verses. Joseph Smith's translation of Luke 12, verses 8 through 12, gives us this added insight and tells us this. Also I say unto you, Whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. But he who denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. And so he's going to now turn to the topic of be careful. Those of you who have started to follow me, who have received witnesses by revelation, that if you turn from the witnesses you received, you're starting to get on dangerous ground. He's going to now talk about the sin against the Holy Ghost. And so this verse, these verses in 8 through 12 in Luke chapter 12 tells us that some started who had confessed him are now not confessing him. And that they are now ashamed and they deny him. Those who, some of his followers, some of his disciples. Now the reason for these words, the reason why he just said these words is this. Verse 10 in Luke chapter 12, General Joseph Smith translation. Verse 10. Now his disciples knew that he said this because they had spoken evil against him before the people. For they were afraid to confess him before men. See, some who have started following him, some who have received revelation, they are now starting to turn. They are now starting to be ashamed. Verse 11. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, He knoweth our hearts, and he speaketh to our condemnation, and we shall not be forgiven. But he answered them and said unto them, verse 12, Whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man and repenteth, it shall be, given him, be forgiven him. But unto him who blasts with me against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him. You can speak against me. You can deny me. You can do whatever. That is fine. But once you've received a sure witness by revelation from the Holy Ghost, then you are getting on dangerous ground if you decide to now deny that. And so they're starting to go towards this, and so he's starting to warn them of the dangers they may be facing. Some of the disciples had known and still knew of his divine sonship, and yet... Fearing men, unable to withstand the social and religious pressures of the day, they had joined with the dominant religious groups and spoken evilly of this man of whom Moses wrote. Can traitors be forgiven? Could they again find grace in his sight? So you can imagine all these questions now coming as some have started to now turn on him who, want, who had received a witness by revelation. Thus the warning in Matthew 12, 31 through 32, which states, Wherefore I say unto you, All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world nor nor in the world to come. So what does sinning against the Holy Ghost constitute? 
while Elder Bruce R. McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve writes the following. There is an unpardonable sin, a sin which there is no forgiveness, neither in time nor in eternity. It is blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. It is to deny Christ to come out in open rebellion, to make open war against the Son of Man, after gaining, by the power of the Holy Ghost, a sure and perfect knowledge of the truth and divinity of the Lord's work. It is to shed innocent blood, meaning to assent unto the death of Christ, to crucify him afresh, Paul says, with a full and absolute knowledge that he is the Son of God. It is to wage open warfare, as does Lucifer, against the Lord and his anointed, knowing that the course so pursued is evil. It is to deny, to say the sun does not shine while seeing its blazing eye, it is to deny Christ after a sure and irrevocable testimony has been received by the power of the Holy Ghost. Hence, it is a scurrilous and evil declaration against the Holy Ghost, against the sole and only source of absolute and sure knowledge. It is blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. End of Brother McConkie's quote. So it takes a perfect knowledge, witness, revelation. And while you know that, while you know the sun shines, while you're looking at the sun, and you look at the sun and declare it is not there, that kind of knowledge, you turn against Christ while you look at him and you know he is the Christ and you deny him and you turn against him after receiving that witness from the Holy Ghost. That is the unpardonable sin, a perfect knowledge of truth and divinity of the Lord's work. And then another warning in Matthew 12, 34 through 37, he says, O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. See, there's more to it than just evil acts. We have got to now consider our thoughts and our words. Are just men's works of wickedness and overact evil acts needed to warrant one to be damned? Jesus here is preaching strong doctrine. Something less than evil acts will pull down curses upon the heads of the children of men. It is sufficient to think evil thoughts and to speak evil words. These alone identify what is in the heart of man and show the nature and kind of being he is. So our thoughts and our words show what our heart is. And if those being evil are enough to condemn us, let alone the evil acts that we commit, may we be careful May we watch our thoughts and our words. Now, in the Joel Smith translation of Matthew 12, 37, Christ that says, Then came some of the scribes and said unto him, Master, it is written that every sin shall be forgiven. But you say, Whatsoever speak against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven. And they asked him, saying, how can these things be? Do you see, the scribes and Pharisees, whenever they're asking questions, they're not interested in the truth or an answer to it. They are trying to convict him of something so the people will stop following them. They're trying to say, look, this man is not consistent. He just said that you can be forgiven of sin. But now he says, there is a sin that you commit against the Holy Ghost. You cannot be forgiven him. Oh, don't follow him. Look how wishy-washy he is. The Savior has clearly taught the law of forgiveness and the pardoning grace of his atonement. Yet there is an exception to that law. 
And so he teaches the exception because some may be getting close to committing it. It is that those who blaspheme against the Holy Ghost shall be damned eternally. For them there shall be no remission of sins. They cannot repent and they cannot be forgiven. This condemnation reserved for those only who have walked in the light and who now chose to say the sun does not shine while they see it. By raising the question again, the scribes are going to great lengths to find fault with Jesus and raise questions in the public mind about his teachings. It shows you how prideful and how envious they were of the Savior that they were going to any length to try to discredit him when all they had to do was turn their hearts and they would receive so many blessings. The same is true with us today, brothers and sisters. Where is our heart and who is it turned to? The Joseph Smith translation of Matthew 12, 38 now says, And he said unto them, When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. But when a man speaketh against the Holy Ghost, then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth, he findeth him empty, swept, and garnished. For the good spirit leaveth him unto himself. Well, what does that mean? Here's what he's trying to say to them. Meaning, when a man is baptized for remission of sins, as some of them had been, and when evil and iniquity are burned out of him as though by fire, by the power of the Holy Ghost, when he becomes clean and pure and spotless before the Lord, when he has thus sanctified his soul, if he then sins against the Holy Ghost and loses the Spirit of the Lord as his companion, he is left in a fit condition to be swallowed up in every form of evil and iniquity. The house that was once swept and garnished, that was once a fit habitation for the Holy Spirit of God, that house is now vacant. The Spirit of the Lord will not dwell there longer, and the spirit of evil returns, returns to a vacant house with a force and a vigor exceeding anything of the past. So you can see him warning those who have been baptized, they've entered his church, they've received revelation, they've had a witness. Now the Holy Ghost is not upon the earth yet for them to have the gift of it yet. So that may be their saving thing here with them. But he's trying to warn them that once you turn against that, the Holy Ghost leaves and you are now left for the spirit of Satan to enter into your hearts and for things to be worse than they were before. And so he's trying to warn those who have joined and have gained a witness that if you turn, Satan will once again enter your hearts and will cause great problems in your life. Then Joseph Smith's translation, Matthew 12, 39, he says, Then goeth the evil spirit and taketh with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last end of that man is worse than the first, even so shall it be unto the wicked generation. In other words, once you leave, join the church and gain a witness of the truth and follow Christ, you leave neutral ground. If you decide to leave the church, you can't go back to neutral ground and just be neutral. The spirit leaves and you're now left for the things of the world to come and encumber your heart and for the wickedness of Satan to be more prevalent in your life. It's, it's, it's as Elder Maxwell said, that those who seem to leave the church just can't seem to leave it alone. They must constantly fight against it to rationalize the choices that they have made. There appears to be those among them, obviously, who have chosen to follow the Son of Righteousness. We're now turning back, turning to worldly things, turning to follow Lucifer, their father, because their deeds were evil. So he's warning of those, of what is going to happen to them. Brother Bruce R. McConkie writes, In answering the question of these capricious scribes, Jesus is saying, in effect, If you gain a perfect knowledge of me and my mission, it must come by revelation from the Holy Ghost.
That Holy Spirit must speak to the Spirit within you, and then you shall know nothing doubting. But to receive this knowledge and revelation, you must cleanse and perfect your own soul. That is, your house must be clean, swept, and garnished. Then if you deny me by speaking against the Holy Ghost, who gave you your revelation of the truth, that is, if you come out in open rebellion against the perfect light you have received, the Holy Ghost will depart, leaving you to yourself. Your house will now be available for other tenancy, and so the evil spirits and influences you had once conquered will return to plague you. Having completely lost the preserving power of the Spirit, you will then be worse off than if you had never received the truth. And many in this generation shall so shall be so shall be so condemned. And so he's trying to warn them. Those who had turned to the truth, who had lived and who received witnesses, that who are now turning against him, that their lives are going to be worse off than they were before because of the light knowledge they did have. And so it is today, brothers and sisters, once we embrace the truth, if we decide to completely turn there from it, our, our lives will be worse than they were before we ever embraced the truth. Well, while he's giving these teachings, without is his mother and his brothers and sisters, and they want to see him, and someone says, your mother and your brothers and sisters are without, and Christ turning to the multitude, to those he is teaching, and says, Matthew twelve fifty, for whosoever, or he says, who are my brothers or my sisters? And then he says, for whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is heaven, the same as my brother, my sister, and mother. Now, he was not trying to put down his mother and his brothers and sisters without. He was just trying to use a teaching opportunity and trying to teach this. There are some things more important than familial inheritance. All men cannot be born into this world as the Son of God, after the manner of the flesh. But all through righteousness can be adopted into the family of the eternal God and become joint heirs with Christ of the fullness of the glory and the power of the Father. All people cannot be the literal seed of Mary, but all through righteousness can be adopted into the family of her firstborn son and become his brothers and sisters. He was just trying to teach that just because they're that's my mother out there and that's brother and sister, that doesn't mean that they're better than you, that they have a greater claim upon me than you. But he's trying to say making and keeping covenants puts you into my family. Then you become my children or my brothers and my sisters. We become of one family. Who then are members of the family of Lucifer and who? the family of the Lord Jesus Christ. Are we not all children of him whom we list to obey? Brothers and sisters, you and I will decide which family we belong to. Who we obey is who our parents are. If I list to obey Jesus Christ, then he becomes my father. If I list to obey Satan, then he becomes my father. May we choose wisely who we decide to obey and whose family we decide to enter into. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button and consider subscribing to my channel.